Welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. I'm John Lomakang. Thank you for taking the time every week, whatever day of the week it is, to join us here on 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We enjoy it, and this quarter has been a dynamic, dynamic journey through three cosmic messages, the first, second, and third angel's message. And today, we're going to be bridging on the second angel's message. We spent a lot of time on fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. We talked about true worship compared to preferred worship. And we are going to be diving in. Continue to pray for us because this is a delicate topic on any given day. And we want to handle it with the love of God, but with the veracity and the truth of God's word. But before we go any further, let me introduce our panel. To my immediate left is Jill Marconi, Vice President of 3ABN. Good to have you here, Jill, all the time. Thank you, Pastor John. I have Monday's lesson, The Wine of the Wrath. Okay, and my other hand, I'm John James, <laughs> the Sons of Thunder. Good to have you here, James. Good to be here, John. I have Tuesday's lesson, which is entitled, Mystery Babylon the Great. Oh, wow. Wow, that's, that's thick grape juice right there. Shelly Quinn. Yeah, mine is Wednesday, A Call to Commitment. Okay, and all the way down, Daniel. Dare to be a Daniel Perrin. Good to have right, you, Daniel. That's right. I have Thursday's lesson, Babylon, the center of idolatry. Wow. So you see why we're going to be talking about the city called confusion. Before we go any further, I'm going to ask Daniel, could you have our prayer for us today? Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we come to your word because we know that uh, any other place we go will lead us astray, but we can trust what you have said. Yeah. And we can trust Jesus, who is the word made flesh. So as we study today, as we present, as we come into your presence, Lord, lift us up by your truth and help us to walk according to it. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'll begin with a statement that doesn't come from the book of Revelation. We find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. This is a powerful statement. And the Apostle Paul, after he talked about the need for love in all aspects of our lives, without love, prophecy, uh, our abilities, our gifts are of no value. But he says something in verse 33 of chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, these words, for God is not the author of confusion. So if God is not the author of confusion, what's wrong in the Christian world today? The question is, is God involved in the confusion that exists in the Christian world today? And the answer is obviously not, because God is not the author of confusion. He is the author of salvation to those who obey him, not the author of confusion. He's the author and finisher of our faith, but not the author of confusion. So can we just worship God anyhow and God accepts it no matter what? Is God a God who's a God of specificity or is God just this general God that meanders in the maze of mediocrity? God is not a God who accepts mediocre. He made it clear in the days of Elijah, if the Lord be God, then serve him. But if Baal, then serve him. How long halt you between two opinions? And so today we're going to talk about that. These two contrasting systems, one based on opinion, obviously the other based on God's word. But how long do we falter between those two ideologies? And today, the Apostle Paul makes it very clear, we're living in the, in the atmosphere where we have a form of godliness, but something's missing. How can confusion prevail? Denying the power thereof. The Holy Spirit is missing because the Holy Spirit never leads us into a form of godliness. The Holy Spirit always leads us into a place of obedience. And for some reason, obedience is seen as minimal today and a style of worship or an experience of worship or an atmosphere of worship or worship music or some kind of worship is touted over obedience to the truth of God's word. So let's look at the two systems introduced, the two contrasting systems. Let's begin in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. We know this one very well. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. Jill, read that for us. Sure. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring or the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now that's one of the systems introduced right there. And recently somebody asked me and somebody said, well, you can't keep the commandments. It's impossible to keep the commandments. And the Lord gave me this phrase, not even the devil believes that. Mm. 
Not even the devil believes that the commandments cannot be kept. If he believed that they couldn't be kept, he would not be warring with those who keep it. Revelation 14, 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. Revelation 22, verse 14, blessed are they that keep his commandments. The devil knows that by the power of God, by the indwelling Holy Spirit, Philippians 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So why would the Lord say, if you love me, keep my commandments? Ah, but you can't do it. No, he empowers us for it is God who works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Philippians 2 and verse 13. So if your pastor tells you the commandments can't be kept, say, Pastor, not even the devil will lie to me that way. Mm. Be honest with me. You see, friends, we're living in the day and age where confusion exists. It prevails everywhere. So one of the first systems are those who keep the commandments of God, which the devil is angry with. He wouldn't be angry if it was impossible by God's strength to honor and keep the commandments. Let's look at the second system, Revelation 17, verses 1 and 2. Uh, let Revelation 17, verses 1 and 2. Who could read that one for me? The first one to get to that. Revelation and 17. Came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show thee the judgment of the great whore which sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. That's the other system. Two contrasting systems. Notice. The devil is angry with one of those. And then the other one, he has caused them to go off into harlotry, mm. the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Revelation 17, 15, waters represents people, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So the entire earth is affected by this religious system. It would not be considered fornication unless there was some kind of relationship that was adulterated. So you see this dishonest relationship. Revelation talks about this to one of the seven churches that Jezebel, the kings of the earth, they went to bed with her. And what is that saying today? The political leaders of our earth are in bed with religious falsity in our world. There's a system of religion that has caused the political leaders of the world to become enamored by her. And therefore she holds sway over the inhabitants of the earth. What happened to them? The inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. What does wine do? Look at Jeremiah 51, verse 7. Shall you read that for us? Sure. Jeremiah 51, 7. Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunk. The nations drank her wine. Therefore, the nations are deranged. Mm. That's amazing. So what's happening today is there is a there is an intoxication. Now let's think about that for a brief moment. Intoxication. One of the reasons why a police officer that pulls a person over that he suspects is maybe intoxicated, what does he ask them to do? Walk a straight line. Now this is powerful. You can't walk a straight line doctrinally if you're intoxicated. You can't walk a straight line spiritually if you're intoxicated by the wine of Babylon. You see, one of the reasons why people can't preach a straight message is because they are intoxicated by the doctrines of Babylon. That's why they preach crooked messages like Sunday is a new day of worship or people die and go to heaven or the secret rapture. These are doctrines that have intoxicated people to drink wine from a different cup, not from the cup of the Lord. So when you, see, when you hear these messages, don't say, well, that's just the way they believe. No, say, wait, they're deranged. Why, do the, why does the Bible use the word deranged? Because they can't get that from the wine of God's word. So you can't put new wine, the truth of God's word, in old wineskins. You got to be made new. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. You got to come out of that old way of belief, but the only way that can happen is if you're new in Christ. So the Lord doesn't seek to put old new wine, the truth of his word, in old wineskins. Right. He seeks to make that wineskin brand new. So that's why he said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. The born again message is followed by the born again person mm -hmm. or the born again person accepts the born again message. When you are in the system of Babylon deranged by her wine, you know, drunk people, you could tell them anything and they'll believe it, <laughs> honestly. People that are drunk, when they finally are uh, sober, they are, they are shocked at their behavior. Did I do that? Did I say that? Did I really go there? And what happens when a person is deranged? They go where the alcohol is in control, mm. where the inebriation is continued. That's why they say, give me another drink. What does a drunk person want? Another drink. 
What does intoxicated people want? Another drink until they're at the point where they pass out. And watch this. When the Bible talks about intoxication, it says your eyes will behold strange women. Now watch this. You can't see a church for what it is because you're intoxicated. The Bible uses the phrase woman as a church. Your eyes behold strange women. You can't see a real pure woman. You can't find the truth because you're intoxicated. So what has to happen? There needs to be a spiritual detoxification taking place in Christianity today. And to give a person alcohol, to get them off of alcohol, is something that could be done medically, and the doctors do that. But you don't give a person another drink to get them to be freed from drinking. You have to give them the purity of God's word, the water of life. Jesus is not referred to as the wine of life. He's the water of life. His blood is referred to as wine because it's pure, it's unadulterated. So today, one of the reasons why it talks about Babylon, Revelation 14, verse 8, it says, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This is, this is international. Every continent, every system, both political and religious, is in some way uh, adhering to the wine of this woman who's causing the kings of the earth, even political leaders, to be partakers of her fornication. Why fornication? She has departed from her husband. And James says, do you not know that friendship of the world is adultery? Yes. So when you are either by social behavior, political behavior, economic behavior, or religious behavior, in any relationship that does not include truth, it's spiritual adultery. The Lord is saying, come out of that, come out of her. Notice that, come out of her, my people. He knows that, John 10, 16, there are people that love him are in all these different movements, but amazingly or not, amazingly enough, he doesn't want them to stay there. He says, come out of her, my people. Don't stay in that harlot system, come out of her. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sin. That's why when the Bible describes this woman, she has purple and scarlet. Well, what color is missing? the color blue, because blue is synonymous with the commandments of God. So she is a substitute system. She has earthly priests. What are they a substitute of? Our high priest. Right. So you see all these substitutes. And the reason why people don't protest that is because they are drunk. They are deranged. They see absolutely nothing wrong with it. Why would a deranged person see something wrong with the wrong day of worship? Why would a deranged person see something wrong with the wrong belief about what happens when you die? They can't because they are deranged. They are intoxicated. So what's the answer? Come away from the form of godliness and accept the truth of God's word. Don't be in a religious system that is based on works. Be in a religious system that is based on the truth of God's word and the faith by which we are saved. Be willing to accept the truth of God's word and then you begin to see that the more pure water comes in, the detoxification begins, and then you'll see the unadulterated truth of God's Word. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor John. I love to hear you teach the Word of God. That was Thank powerful. You. I'm Jill Morricone. I have Monday's lesson, The Wine of the Wrath, and we pick up on a lot of the same themes mm -hmm. that Pastor John just explained so eloquently. We know in Revelation chapter 12, we have the pure woman, representing the pure church. In Jeremiah, it says, I've likened the daughter of Zion to a lovely and delicate woman. We know in Revelation 17, as Pastor John just talked about, we have this harlot woman representing the apostate church. We know that the harlot, you referenced Revelation 17, 15, she sits on many waters. You know, if you look at Jeremiah chapter 51 and that reference to ancient Babylon, it talks about the waters of Babylon, the river Euphrates. We have Jeremiah 51, 13. O you who dwell by many waters, abundant in treasures, your end has come. Mm -hmm. The measure of your covetousness. The Euphrates, its tributaries, its canals dominated the ancient Babylon scenery. The harlot is resting on the waters, representing, as you already talked about, the multitudes, nations, and tongues. This apostate system of worship influences the world. It has reached the world with her wine, mm -hmm. with her deception. And she commits fornication, as you talked about, with the kings of the earth, meaning the political system, 
the kings of the earth, and then we have the church system or the religious system, which is the harlot. And when they intermarry, when they intertwine, when there is this illicit relationship, we have this false uniting. You know, the true church is supposed to be united to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. She's the bride of Jesus Christ. This false church system receives its power and authority from the political leaders of the world. The state will enforce the church's doctrine. Mm -hmm. We saw this during the Dark Ages from 538 to 1798. What happened when the Roman Catholic Church re uh, reigned supreme in Revelation 17, 6, it says, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So the Roman Catholic Church killed many people for their faith in Jesus, mm -hmm. for their uh, clinging to the unadulterated truth of the Word of God. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about this fermented grape juice, this wine of the wrath of her fornication, these false doctrines. The apostate church will think to change times and laws. We see that in Daniel 7, verse 25, speaking of the little horn power. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall in intend to change times and laws. We see that this wine is fermented by teaching tradition or false doctrines instead of the pure word of God. Okay. Matthew 15, verse 9, Jesus says, In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So I'm going to talk about seven dangerous wines that emerge from Babylon. Now there's probably more and you all could come up with more, but we're just going to limit it to seven. Dangerous wine number one is that salvation is earned. Mm -hmm. It's earned by works. It's earned by merit. It's earned by efforts. Forgiveness of sins somehow obtained through even indulgences. The pure grape juice, the truth of the word of God, Jesus, the living water says what? Salvation is freely offered by the perfect life and the sacrifice of Jesus, the Son of God. Amen. It's 1 John 1, 7. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. You see, our works don't save us. It's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 2, we've referenced this many times on the set. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace we have been saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Mm -hmm. Wine number two, Sabbath rest is on Sunday. We already referenced uh, Roman, uh, Daniel 7.25. The Roman Catholic Church thought to change times and laws. Now, they didn't change God's law, mm -hmm. but they thought mm -hmm. to change God's law. Well, Jesus was resurrected on Sunday. We have authority and we're going to change the day that was set apart and consecrated and made holy from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week. Mm -hmm. What does the Word of God say? We've studied this and if you missed it, you missed a great lesson last week. Make sure you tune in and catch that on the sanctity of the seventh day Sabbath. Mm -hmm. The fourth commandment, Exodus 20, 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Mm -hmm. What a gift. Wine number three, the immortality of the soul. That lie began all the way back in Eden when the serpent mm -hmm. said to Eve, you shall not surely die. And it has been perpetuated through this entire history of this earth that the body dies and returns to dust, but the soul or the spirit somehow lives on, whether it's in purgatory or as some disembodied spirit in heaven. And we know mm. the truth of the word of God, that the dead know nothing. They are in an unconscious state like sleep, awaiting the resurrection of Jesus or final judgment. Ecclesiastes 9, 5 and 6, the living know they shall die, but the dead, they know nothing, neither have they any reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, their envy have now perished. Why number four is that images are to be venerated and worshiped. Mm -hmm. 
This is why statutes are placed in churches. This idolatry of putting the image before the maker or the creator. What is the truth of the word of God saying? This is the second commandment. Exodus 20, verse 4. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or a graven image, King James says, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands and to those who love me and keep my commandments as the pure church does, Pastor John brought out in Revelation 12, verse 17. Why number five is that the priests are the mediators between God and men. In other words, I can't go directly to God with my sins. I need a person between God who stands in place of God and I confess my sins to them. And yet the truth of the word of God, 1 Timothy 2, 5, I love this scripture, Shelley. There is a one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Amen. You and I don't have to go to priests. You and I don't have to go to other people. We go directly to Jesus and we say we confess our sins. Hebrews 9, 15, for this reason, for the blood of Christ, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant. Why number six, transubstantiation. Did I say that word right? Mm -hmm. That is the belief that when you partake of communion, the, the grape juice and the bread actually changes into the blood and the body of Jesus. Now we could use many scriptures to counteract that, but or talk about the literal or the figurative and all of those type of things. But I like just reading on. If you continue reading in Matthew 26, verse 29, Jesus clarifies it because he says, I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine. He's not referring to himself. He refers to it as the grape juice, That's as right. the fruit of the vine. Uh, dangerous wine number seven immaculate conception, the belief that Mary was free from original sin, from her conception. Therefore, Jesus somehow had an advantage over you and I because Mary was without sin. But the truth is, Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, yes. But Mary had predisposition and tendencies to sin like the rest of us. Therefore, Jesus has no advantage over us. He was born with hereditary tendencies to sin, and yet he did not sin. In Hebrews 4, 15, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. There's more dangerous wines from Babylon. But the point is, when we look at the Word of God and we study the unadulterated truth found therein, to me, when I study the wine versus the truth, there's freedom in truth. Amen. There's peace in truth. There's deliverance in truth. There's victory in truth. So I just want to invite you to choose the truth of the Word of God and the pure church over the adulterated wine of the harlot system of Revelation 17. Amen. Thank you, Jill. Thank you so much. Wow. You know, as you can tell, this is a concentrated lesson, but the purpose of it is to counteract the counterfeit. There is a city called confusion and God has called us to make sure that we can tell you what that is and how you can avoid it. So don't go away. There's much more to come. Ever wish you could watch a 3 Abian Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3 Abian Sabbath School panel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. 
Well, friends, we're going to continue our study on a city called Confusion, and James is going to deal with Mystery Babylon the Great. Mystery Babylon the Great, that's Tuesday's lesson. We're in Revelation chapter 17. We're picking, off just where we, picking up just where we left off, but we're going to pick up in verse 4 of Revelation chapter 17. My name is James Rafferty. Let's get into the Word. And the woman, talking about this corrupt church, was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. We talked about that a little bit. Decked with gold and precious stones. She's a wealthy church in pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. She's in a moral church and we'll talk about that, about those abominations here in a bit. And upon her forehead was writ a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So this is a mother church. That means she has daughter churches. That means there are other churches, other systems, religious systems that teach what she teaches, that, that teach doctrines that come from her. And then it says in verse 6, And I saw the, the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So we've got a religious system here and it's teaching spiritual lies. Now I just want to give you some verses here in Proverbs chapter 6 because the word that is used in Revelation 17 is abominations. This is how God defines abominations in Proverbs chapter 6 beginning with verse 16. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Oh, what, what is an abomination unto the Lord? Verse 17, a proud look, a lying tongue, and he that sheds innocent blood. Well, we check all of those lists when we go back to Revelation 17 and identify this woman. But it goes on. A heart, verse 18, that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift, swift in running to blood or running to mischief. And then verse 19, a false witness that speaks lies and he that sows discord among brethren. Now, we were talking about this between our, our sessions during our break and we were trying it to, uh, well not trying, we were just simply saying that we are not teaching here anything outside of what this church actually admits to. So when we look at the teachings of this church, this church admits to the very things that we're pointing out. For example, Daniel chapter 7 verse 25, the Roman Catholic Church admits to changing times and laws. They just, yes, we, that, we've got the authority to do that. We're doing that. So sometimes we can come across as critical, but really all, what we're doing here is we're pointing out exactly what the church has determined to do in violating the morality of God's laws and the morality of God's teachings. And that's why she's called a harlot. And that's why she's teaching these lies or abominations. She's got a cup full of wine of abominations or lies. They're spiritual lies. The church is lying to the people that support it about what the Word of God teaches. Right. How so? Well, let's take a closer look here. It says she's intoxicated with the persecuting of God's people. In other words, she's intoxicated with the blood of God's people. Now, uh, Pastor John brought out that that means she's not thinking clearly. When you're intoxicated, you're not thinking clearly. You're not walking that straight line. Let me just share this with you. Jill brought out the idea of the natural immortality of the soul. Now. This is the reasoning of the church, not my reasoning, not the way we think, but this is the way the church thinks back in the dark ages specifically. You can look at the history books and find this. If people live for eternity, either in heaven or hell, and people who are going to hell are going to be burning in eternity for all eternity if they don't believe what we believe, if they don't, if they don't accept the teachings of our church, it would be better for us to do whatever we need to do, persecution, torture, whatever it takes to get them to believe because it'd be better for them to suffer at our hands for a little while and turn those heretics into believers than for them to suffer for all eternity. Now, I don't want you to miss this point because this point is prevalent in our world today. We are going to make people suffer. We are going to strip them of the ability to buy and sell, to feed their families, to have a job, to do the things they need to do because we know better than them. And it'd be better for them to do what we want them to do, even though they don't want to do what we want them to do, to do what we want them to do for the good of society. That's the principle that has come through the dark ages and we are returning to the dark ages when we look at and follow that principle. So this is the principle. So the point we're trying to make here is this church becomes convinced that what they're doing is right and others who support it are convinced because deranged, mad, intoxicated, they're not seeing things right. And we've got to get into the water of life. We've got to get into the Word of God in order to be clear on this, in order to be able to see things correctly. Otherwise, we're going to go along. If we're drunk with the same 
toxic intoxication that's gone through all the nations, we're not going to see things right either. Not the way, we're not going to see things the way that God sees them. So as we've gone through these three angels' messages, we've learned some things about what God is teaching and it contrasts with, with what Babylon is teaching. For example, fear God is the first announcement of the everlasting gospel. Now to fear God means to be uh, in awe of God, not just to be afraid of Him. It means to, to reverence God. And it, it comes from the Bible. For example, in Psalm 133 and 4, it says, If thou, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who should stand? But there's forgiveness with thee that thou mightest be feared. Another verse, uh, Psalm 147, verse 11, the the Lord takes pleasure in them that fear Him in those that hope in His mercy. So to fear God is to hope in the mercy of God. It's to realize that God doesn't hold our sins against us. He held them against Jesus Christ. It's to recognize the everlasting gospel, Christ on the cross, crying out to the Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Now in sharp contrast to this teaching, over one billion Christians today are taught that they can earn salvation by their works. Yeah. Jill touched on this. It's the idea of indulgences, of deeds of charity, of self-denial, of of purchasing grace. Purgatory is another option for those who are not quite as faithful. Uh, they can suffer in purgatory or they can be prayed through purgatory, suffer for a while until they're good enough to go to heaven. Let me just give you a quotation so that you know that we're not speaking on our own here. This is found, from the cat found in the Catholic Catechism of the Church, 1995 edition. All who die in God's grace and friendship but still in per perfect but, but still imperfectly purified, imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation. But after they undergo purification so as to achieve holiness, the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. Did you catch that? Another statement from the same book, page 269, that one was 268. The church also commends almsgiving, indulgences, and works of penance undertaken on behalf of the dead. So you see, the doctrine of purgatory undermines the everlasting gospel. It undermines the call to fear God or trust in His mercy, to believe that He hasn't counted our sins against us, but He's counted them against Jesus so that we could go free if we would just put our faith in Jesus Christ. It distorts the atonement of Christ. It distorts the atonement that Christ has made and it distorts the character of God. It shows that we can somehow earn our salvation. This Babylonian system, again, being set up on the... On the uh, plains of Shinar. What about the phrase, give glory to Him? We know that give glory to, to, to God means that we're saved by grace through faith, and that's a, not of ourselves, it's the gift of God, lest anyone should boast or glory. We know that we are, that's Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. We know that we are, according to 1 Corinthians chapters, uh, chapter 1, verses 30 and 31, we are uh, made uh, in Christ. Oh, Christ has made our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption, that as according as it is written, that he that glory, let him glory in the Lord. We know according to 1 Corinthians 10, 31, that whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we do it all to the glory of God. God gets all the glory for salvation. We cannot save ourselves. Here's what the Catholic Church teaches. Again, from the Catholic Catechism, and we're looking here on page uh, 487 of the 1995 edition. Since the initiative belongs to God in the order of grace, no one can merit the initial grace of forgiveness and justification at the beginning of conversion. But moved by the Holy Spirit and by charity, we can then merit for ourselves and for others the graces needed for our sanctification, for the increase of grace and charity, and for the attainment of eternal life. Jill, you mentioned that the, in an earlier session that there are some Adventists who are leaning toward this idea of evolution. Well, there are some Adventists that are leaning toward this Catholic idea of salvation, meriting our salvation. Even temporal goods like health and friendship can be merited in accordance with God's wisdom. These graces and goods are the object of Christian prayer. Prayer attends to the grace we need for meritorious actions. Uh-uh. No, there are no meritorious actions when it comes to salvation. We cannot merit our salvation in any way, shape, and form. It's either by grace or it's by works. If it's by grace, then it's no longer works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it's works, it's no longer grace. Otherwise, works are no longer works. That's Romans chapter 11 and verse 6. I'm almost out of time. So we see here another message. The hour of His judgment has come. Jesus Christ is our advocate in the heavenly sanctuary. We have a, a mediator that, that pleads in our behalf and we can go directly to Him as you just said. He's this one mediator between God and man. What does the Catholic Church say? This is Los Angeles Times, December 12, 1984, rebutting a belief shared by Protestants and a growing number of Roman Catholics. Pope John Paul II on Thursday dismissed the idea that one can... Uh, obtained forgiveness directly from God and exhorted Catholics to confess more often to their priests. These aren't some antiquitated, 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 
antiquated, antiquated, antiquated statements <laughs> taken yeah. from the, the archives of, of history and blow the dust off and the cobwebs off. These are statements from the 20th century, 1995, 1984. Friends, we are dealing with a message that is vital, the three cosmic mm -hmm. angels, the three cosmic messages of Revelation chapter 14 because they need to bring down the system of confusion, the system of Babylon, and they need to give us a clarion call to worship God and to trust in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, I'll tell you, you guys, that's on fire. My name is Shelley Quinn, and I will be giving Wednesday's lesson a call to commitment. I just want to make a point right up close. We are looking at Revelation's appeal in the three angels' messages that are a call to commit to Christ, but it's summarized in these two women of Revelation, the pure church that's following the commandments of God and the spiritual Babylon mm -hmm. that is the apostate church. Mm -hmm. And it is not, we're talking about systems, not people. Mm -hmm. God's got a people in every mm -hmm. church. But the system of apostate Babylon is our spiritual Babylon includes more than the Roman papal system. It is the apostate Protestantism as well. Let's look at this. When, when Jesus, Simon Peter, uh, he asked Jesus, or Jesus asked him, who do you say I am? And he says, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And in Matthew 16, 17, Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, for flesh and blood has not re revealed this to you, but my father who's in heaven. And I say to you, you're Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. What rock? It wasn't the rock of Peter. He was a little pebble. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ is is the rock, the so solid yeah. foundation of his church. He was the rock from the Old Testament. That's a word for the Lord. First Corinthians 10, 4, Paul says, they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. That rock was Christ. And we know as many as receive Christ, we become children of God. Now, Christ's church is built on his teaching. He said in Matthew 4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth. It is guided by the Holy Spirit. In Romans 8, 14, it says, as many as are led by the Holy Spirit are children of God. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're not led by the Spirit, what does that mean? You're not, you're not a covenant child of God. Babylon is not following the spirit of truth. Babylon is not following every word. It, there's spiritual confusion and it's man-made teachings and traditions. The word of God is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Man can't take this word and say, eh, let's say this, let's do that. In Mark 7, 13, Jesus told the Jews, you make void the word of God. You make it, you invalidate it. It's null and void. And how is he saying you do that? Through your traditions, you're nullifying God's word. Our study guide says, any religious leader who substitutes human opinions or traditions in the place of or above the revealed will of God in the scriptures is simply fostering Babylonian confusion. Mm -hmm. In Revelation 17, 14, it's talking about these, the beasts that are going to make war with the lamb, the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. And the lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of Lords, King of Kings. And those who are with the lamb, listen to this. They are called, they with him are called chosen. Oh, people right. like to say I'm called, I'm chosen, <laughs> but you can't leave out the third word. Right. They are called, chosen, and faithful. Amen. You know, in Daniel 3, ancient Babylon, we see combined church and state. King Nebuchadnezzar represented the pagan idols, and what he did was set up an idol 
to himself, really. Mm -hmm. And he passed the universal decree of worship. If you didn't fall down and worship his idol, <laughs> into the fire you went. <laughs> so what happens with spiritual Babylon? Revelation tells us history is going to repeat itself, mm -hmm. that the church and state are going to be combined and arise and a spiritual leader will claim to speak as God and decree worship of the false image of the beast. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, this religious leader, listen how Paul describes him, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, mm -hmm. showing himself that he is God. Mm -hmm. Now listen to what Mark Finley wrote in our study guide. Throughout the centuries, the Roman pontiffs have declared that they stand in the place of God on earth. In his encyclical letter of June 20th, 1894, Pope Leo VIII stated, this is the Pope speaking about Popery, uh, Leo XIII, yes. <laughs> we hold upon this earth the place of Almighty God. Mm -hmm. That's what he's saying about being the Pope. And then in the Ferraris Ecclesiastical Dictionary, it adds, the Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as, as it were, God and the vicar of God. Mm. He's saying that vicariously, the Pope, is taking the place of God. So, as I said, the spiritual Babylon is more than just papal Rome. It includes the apostate Protestant. I can't say that word, Protestantism. <laughs> and, and you know what? Here's the truth. Many of God's faithful people are in this spiritual confusion. God's got a people in all churches. We're not judging people. In Revelation, 18.4, God is making a final appeal to his people who have been caught up, they're deceived, they're blinded by this intoxicating system that hasn't shared the word of God. And he says, come out of her, my people, lest you receive of her plagues. So God wants his people to come out. And what revelation, the three angels' messages are calling us to make a commitment. They proclaim the eternal gospel of righteousness by faith in Christ. In Revelation 13, 8, it talks about Jesus being the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Revelation 1, 5 says he's the one who loves us and releases us by our sins, by his blood. Revelation 5, 9, Jesus is worthy because he redeemed us to God by his blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. So the first angel is proclaiming this everlasting gospel and it is calling us to enter into covenant relationship with the Lord who has the power to save us. Mm -hmm. And he, he's going to bring this cosmic conflict to an end, but he's calling us, confess your sins before me, repent mm -hmm. to be cleansed. Even repentance is a gift of God. Mm -hmm. He will cleanse us of all unrighteousness. He's calling us in the first angel to worship the creator mm -hmm. alone, to bow down only to the one who is your source of life, mm -hmm. not to the dragon mm -hmm. of spiritual Babylon. And let me tell you something, the highest expression of worship is obedience mm -hmm. motivated by love. So this is an urgent warning, the first angel's message. There's a judgment in process. He's calling us in the first angel's message to commit to preparation for the second coming of Jesus. The second angel proclaims the collapse of this false gospel of Babylon, saying Babylon is falling. And there's an underlying call to commit 
to Sola Scriptura, the Bible alone. Commit to study the Bible so that you won't be deceived by the miraculous works uh, that are false. The third angel proclaims God's judgment on the beast and the mark of the beast while still referencing the Lamb of God. And he's saying, commit to the knowledge of God as our loving, righteous creator. And since worship is the key issue of the cosmic conflict. This is a commitment to be loyal to Christ, right. to accept God's seal, his true Sabbath, and not the mm -hmm. false mark of the beast, which we're going to see is the false Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. The victory of the Lamb, he's already won it all. Christ has defeated the forces of evil, mm -hmm. and he's coming back to completely annihilate them. But 1 Corinthians 15, 57, we can claim, thanks be to God, Amen. who gives us the victory through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Shelley. I'm Daniel Perrin, and I have Thursday's lesson, which is Babylon, the center of idolatry. And as we know, there is no nation or kingdom of Babylon today, which reminds us that in order to identify it, we've got to go back and find the features of Babylon from Scripture, because nothing in the world today is going to come labeled saying, hey, I'm Babylon, <laughs> avoid me. And so we go to the Word of God, and it gives us some defining features, and one of them is the idolatry or the worship of images. Taking you back to Jeremiah 50, where we've been before already, verse 38, and this is a description of why Babylon, the ancient empire, fell by God's hand. It says, for it is the land of carved images, and they are insane with their idols. Mm -hmm. We've already heard the word mad. We've already heard the word deranged, and now insane. In other words, their minds have been taken over. They're not thinking straight. Something has polluted and confused the way that they think. The next chapter, 51, verse 47, says, Therefore, behold, the days are coming that I will bring judgment on the carved images of Babylon. Her whole land shall be ashamed and all her slain shall fall in her midst. In other words, the statement is clear. Babylon is fallen. It may look okay right now. It still may be prosperous, but uh, the results are already certain. And so we see that back in Daniel chapter 3, Babylon erecting this image image that we've already mentioned, but it comes right after chapter 2, where Nebuchadnezzar receives a vision and a clear interpretation of the vision and what it means Babylon will not last forever. And Daniel says at the end of that, the vision is certain and the interpretation of true, and Nebuchadnezzar accepts it. He cannot plead insanity in the courts of God. Hmm. You can plead insanity in the courts of men, but to say to God, no, I, I just, I, I wasn't thinking straight. That doesn't work. It, Babylonian idolatry, though, is not limited just to Babylon. We find that even God's people, Israel and Judah, in 1 Kings, 2 Kings 17 and 21, that's listed as the reason that those in God's church, uh, the reason that uh, Israel and Judah are both defeated by Assyria and Babylon. We find God's clear command regarding idols in Exodus 20, right there, the fourth commandment that says, you shall not make a carved image, any likeness of anything in the heavens above or in the earth beneath or that is in the waters under the earth. You shall not bow yourselves down to them and serve them. And here it says, for the Lord your God is a jealous God. And we tend to think that that's not a positive trait. But you think about any husband whose wife walks away and has adultery with somebody else. Jealousy is an appropriate response there. Saying, no, there's, this is an exclusive relationship. Me and you only. Don't mix with other people. All right. A jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. And so when we take God's word firmly and clearly here, we can recognize that in spiritual practice, when we erect images and statues and believe that there is some power when we stand before them and pray to them or through them, that that goes against the law of God. It's just that clear. And in one sense, idolatry is really easy to recognize because it's visible. It's something we can see with our eyes. Mm -hmm. But in another sense, idolatry can be extremely subtle. Mm 
Right. So it doesn't have to be gold, it doesn't have to be big, and it doesn't have to be expensive or in the shape of a living creature. Anytime we use our own human strength or ingenuity to exalt something to a position of honor or the ability to save us through our own power, it's taking the place and occupying the spot that God alone takes. So we can call ourselves sophisticated now. We don't do things that primitive people did in the past, but I guarantee you that the gods the ancients worshiped or so-called gods are still worshiped today. And what's wrong with idolatry? Go with me to Psalm 115, verse three to eight, and we'll read through it really quickly here. Starting in verse three of Psalm 115, but our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. They're idols of silver and gold. Quickly, they have mouths and don't speak, ears and don't hear. They have eyes and don't see ears, noses, but they don't smell. They have hands, but no, no, nothing to handle, feet, but they can't walk. They do not mutter with their throats. And then verse eight, here is the tragedy of idolatry. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. And so here's what happens. We become a victim of our own creation because we honor something that has no life-giving power. And we, we take this thing that looks okay, but it has no life in it. And so we receive life from God and that's where we should seek it. But imagine me hooking up a hose to myself somehow and trying to turn on a faucet and pour water from myself into a glass for me to drink. I have no life in myself. I can't get it from the things that I make. And this is why Jesus says in John 5, 39 and 40, you search the scriptures. So here's people who even have the words of God. You search the scriptures because you think that in them, in the words on a page, you have life. But they testify of me and yet you refuse. You're unwilling to come to me that you can have life. Right. And so we cut ourselves off from life from God when we put anything else in his place. Idolatry is spiritual adultery, a substitute for God, putting something else in his place. In marriage, we would say, I would never commit adultery, but people still look with lust. They linger over things with their eyes. They, they meditate on and count the failures of their spouse. We do that and we do the same thing with God. I would never uh, worship idols, but we've got all sorts of God substitutes out there. Other teachers, ah, listen to anything he says, anything she says. We turn to a website, an email list, because I love the feelings that that list gives to me. We go to our phones so often. And sure, the phone tells us the weather, but when we get up in the morning, where do we turn first? And if your first turn is to that device, you've got a God substitute. And I hate to say it, why well, she it needs to be said, that we go to Christ first, first in time, first in importance, first in everything. Because a divided loyalty to God is no loyalty at all. And idols do not demand spiritual purity like God does. An idol says, make it your way. Make it the way you want to. Use your strength. Use your skill. Not your feelings, though. All right? Spiritual, uh, sorry, what is this? Spiritual uh, purity does not exist with idolatry. And idolatry shrinks God down to a human-sized box. You want to find God? He's right here. I've got control over him. You come through me. You come through this spot. Solomon said it well there in 1 Kings 8, 27. But will God indeed dwell on earth? The heavens, the highest heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple that I have built. We can't contain God in any one place, any one thing. And so when we try to divide our secular and spiritual life saying, this is my space, my time. This is where I do what I want to do. That's idolatry. Putting God over here in this shrunk down spot. And behind, behind idolatry, behind false idols, are demons. Psalm 106, 36 and 37, they served their idols, which became a snare to them. They sacrificed their sons and daughters to demons. Behind everything that dilutes our loyalty to God or convinces us not to follow him in obedience stands the devil and his lies. So, is there a cure for idolatry? Absolutely. Daniel 3 takes us to that cure. Here you got three guys, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, learn their real names, and they would not bow down to this idol. Why not? Well, they knew something. They knew that, well, 
Yes, they knew. They got thrown into the fire. And what was in the fire there with them? Or who was in the fire? Jesus was with them. But you know, that wasn't the first time Jesus was with them. Jesus was with them while they were standing as well. Nobody else saw it. And they may not have seen anything physical, but he was there. As they were summoned to that place uh, on the day before or however long before and as they walked there, Jesus walked beside them. And in the days, weeks, months and years, Jesus had been their close friend. And so what's the cure for idolatry? It is to experience the real God, the everlasting gospel. Why would you want a substitute? Why would you want a counterfeit when you have something so good, so real? And so these three angels' messages make it clear. Here's the the clear choice. You have the everlasting gospel so clearly demonstrated and proclaimed, and you have Babylon, which is the complete antithesis and opposite. Don't make a choice without knowing the facts. You cannot plead insanity in the courts of God. And so the choice is this, honor God or serve his opposite, serve yourself. And we don't want to put anything else in the place of God. Wow. Well, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Shelly, James, uh, Jill. Give me your closing thoughts. Talked about the wine of Babylon. And I just want to encourage you, maybe some of these truths are new to you. Maybe you are not familiar with everything that we've discussed here today. The key is to have an open heart, to hear what God has and study his word. Amen. Just along those veins, we are looking at a cup full of abominations and the nations have drunk of this cup. And we could spend a lot of time trying to identify all of the abominations in that cup, but it would be better for us to focus on the everlasting gospel because when the everlasting gospel is preached, Babylon falls. Amen and amen. And the everlasting gospel is quite simple. God determined before he even created us that he was going to come down and become a man and die for us. And do you realize how much he loves you? Mm -hmm. Do you realize that he looks to you for a relationship of reciprocal love? Obedience should be motivated by love. Mm -hmm. And when you understand what God has done, you'll love him. When you have Jesus as your close friend, just like John did there in chapter one of Revelation, he shines with the brightness of the sun. There's no idol you could build that could possibly outshine Jesus. That's right, and thank you, friends. The purpose why we have been so intense today, I believe, is found in John 10, 16. Jesus says, lovingly, other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring and get this, and they will hear my voice. Mm -hmm. And there will be one fold and one shepherd, not this multiplicity of a city of confusion. We proclaim this message out of love and a desire for people to know and understand that true love is obeying the commandments of God. But we're not done yet. We're just getting started. So join us for lesson number 10, Satan's Final Deceptions. We look forward to seeing you then.